I want to welcome you back to Theology Curator. My name is Kurt Willems, and I wanted to say a few words about this episode and also just throw in a few personal updates as well. So today I have the opportunity to talk with professor and pastor Dr. Dennis Edwards. Dennis Edwards is no stranger to Theology Curator and certainly not a stranger to my own life. He is someone I met in person about... Wow, it's been six, seven years ago. I mean, it's been a while. And ever since then, he's been someone that I've come back to, sometimes for personal wisdom, sometimes just to check in. He's just someone who's championed my work, and I've tried to champion his as well. And um, I'm so grateful to have him in my life. He's someone I really, truly admire. Now, he has written multiple books, but the one we're going to be talking about today is one that came out in the fall called Might from the Margins. And this is a book that's really geared towards people who come from marginalized backgrounds. So persons of color, um, black and indigenous folks, it's written specifically to say, here is the power, here is your source, here is what it might look like to be empowered in the way of Jesus to live differently in the world. And I just found as a a white guy kind of reading this, that I had so much to learn, not just about my marginalized sisters and brothers, but also about myself and my blind spots and also really learning from a book like this wow there is a cost to following jesus and so i'm really thrilled about this book i think you're going to enjoy this conversation we have and i'm recording this intro on the heels of dr king's birthday celebration on mlk day and so hopefully you get to hear this um, with that sort of conversation in mind as well because i think it's important that we have context to all of these conversations I also wanted to say something unrelated, and that's my book now has a book trailer that is going to be out this week. So if you've not had a chance to check it out up to this point, you're probably not alone because it's barely going to be out, at least at time of recording. So go check it out. You can find it on YouTube, probably by now, Facebook and all the socials as well. And I want to give a huge shout out to my friend Riley Indicott, who created this. He has a YouTube channel. I hope you'll go check him out. He is a Christian and a creative and does some really, really good work. In fact, we're going to have an extended film coming out in the next, uh, I don't know, several weeks or month or so that will be sort of connected to the initial book trailer. So all of that to say, things are gearing up towards a book release. I'm really excited. If you haven't heard, my book is called Echoing Hope, How the Humanity of Jesus Redeems Our Pain. Scott McKnight graciously did the foreword to the book, and Brian Zond was gracious in writing an afterword. And so many other supporters have come alongside and endorsed the thing. It's just mind-blowing to be almost to release date, which will be March 16th, 2021. So, Thank you so much for hearing me out on this intro, and hopefully this episode is able to come along your journey in intelligent and humanizing ways. Welcome to Theology Curator, a podcast hosted by Kurt Willems and available online at theologycurator.com. Each episode looks at a theological, formational, or cultural theme. We might dig into the life and letters of a radical Jewish teacher named Paul, converse about a pressing contemporary issue, reflect on the nature of following Jesus today, or even attempt to remedy doom and gloom preaching with a good old-fashioned dose of hope. This show is an invitation to build bridges between the first century world of the earliest Christ followers into the 21st century reality we now inhabit. The Jesus we excavate from the rubble of tradition might just surprise us all. I want to welcome you back to the podcast. Today, I get to be with uh, my dear friend and just someone that I admire and uh, learn so much from, uh, Dennis Edwards, pastor and now professor doing his uh, professor thing at North Park mm-hmm. Theological Seminary in the Chicago area, or is it in Chicago proper, actually? I, I try to, I'm uh, trying to remember. Right, right in the city, yep. Yeah, yeah. So doing that, of course, we had you on a few months back when your little book on the Bible came out. Uh, and I, I, it was yeah. just awesome. It's so fun. Yeah. And thank you. Man, 
We're just so excited to have you here today. We are going to be talking about your newest book, Might from the Margins, The Gospel's Power to Turn the Tables on Injustice. Mm -hmm. And so I am so deeply uh, excited about this conversation. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to it as well, Kurt. And thanks yeah, for your encouragement and support. And it's, it's fun chatting with you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. And um, in case some listeners today haven't uh, listened to our last conversation, perhaps we can catch them up a little bit and get a little mm -hmm. of your story and sure. um, a, a brief sort of reintroduction. Tell us about your ministry background and how that, mm -hmm. uh, that and your academic background sort of converge and what you're up to now. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll be brief, even though, I, you know, we get old and we got a lot more uh, history to share. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The, for sure. The short, short version is I grew up in New York City and uh, uh, I'm a product of, uh, of uh, busing experiments in New York and that I grew up in African-American community, was bused to a white neighborhood, which kind of raised my sort of uh, racial consciousness. Even as a kid, I attended a storefront church in Queens, New York, where where close to where we lived. And excuse me, and that church uh, had a oneness theology. It didn't believe in a trinity, uh, probably still doesn't. Um, so it so had a kind of an interesting, strange, quirky church experience, mm -hmm. because when I went off to college, I met Christians who believe uh, quite differently. I went to Cornell University, where I got a degree in chemical engineering. And after teaching math and chemistry on the high school level, I eventually went to seminary. I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School at the urging and prompting of Esther I knew. I didn't know anything about a seminary. I should go there. And I yeah. did. I got some money, uh, scholarship money, grace of God. So I was able to go. And as a young uh, husband and father at the time, had two little kids, um, hmm. came back with three and one uh, uh, in utero. So we had four kids all together. Wow. And I, yeah. Yeah. Planted a church in Brooklyn, New York, and then moved to D.C., Ministered in D.C. for about 18 years altogether, and it's where I did my doctoral studies at the Catholic University of America and started teaching adjunct about, oh, about 20 years ago. It was about 2000 or so, 2001, actually. And uh, and I've been an adjunct prof for all those years while also serving as a pastor. Uh, from after D.C., I moved to Minneapolis, and I served the Sanctuary Covenant Church there for six years. And uh, and then took a full time position first at Northern Seminary in uh, suburbs of Chicago and now North Park Theological Seminary in Chicago. Quick, sweeping uh, uh, introduction. <laughs> hey, no, that's great. And um, one of the things that I've always really appreciated about you is uh, your deeply, you're a deeply integrated person. I mean, in the sense that you've had this pastoral ministry experience, you've had this, um, academic, um, ongoing sort of journey through all of that and teaching experience. I, I mean, I just love when those kind of streams converge and, um, the work that comes out often, uh, in your work, it's deeply pastoral and deeply rooted in academics or deeply academic, depending on who and what you're writing uh, for. And um, so I, I just really appreciate the uh, the convergence of streams in your journey. And mm -hmm. I think it really comes through in a big way in Might from the Margins. Hmm. Thank you for that. I, I think that's uh, by the grace of God, a niche that I inhabit and uh, and want to live into. My pastoral experience, I don't see as in conflict with my academic interests, although I admit, um, you know, people in the pew might, who who call me a Bible nerd at times, might, mm -hmm, might, mm -hmm. might have seen my academic interests coming through maybe more than they wanted to. I also see it the other way in that um, my academic work, uh, teaching seminary students, I think is enhanced by all the years I spent as a pastor. And I even will say things to my students about how I think this, whatever I'm teaching them can play out in a church situation. So thanks for noticing. Yeah. I try to keep those worlds together. Yeah. And this book, I mean, it came out, what was, did it come out September 1st? I'm trying to remember when the release of this book well, was. Well, the release date was technically September 8th, although I was noticing people were getting it before the 8th, but that the official release date was September 8th of uh, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you were so kind. I was in the middle of writing my book and I, I said, Hey, do you have any early drafts or any chapters oh, yeah. that I can check out? And, 
Um, and I actually got to just glean some wisdom early on and I appreciated that. And, uh, you know, now to have the full thing here, um, it, it's a really just awesome, awesome take on, um, what it means to lean into the gospel's power, especially for those who find themselves at the margins. And what I'd be interested in is if you would mind giving us kind of a big picture vision for this book. Like right. what is, what is the the goal of this particular work? Uh, thanks for asking it that way. The goal, I'm, I'm going to articulate the goal as I tell you a little bit about the streams that came together that pushed me to kind of do this. Uh, you already acknowledged my pastoral and and academic interest. So I so I've written a commentary on First Peter and was struck by how how the Lord um, through Peter is is uh, speaking to people on the margins, diaspora people who are not fitting into their world, and then even within that diaspora uh, identity are the slaves and women who he addresses particularly, and and in doing so uh, uh, reminds people of attributes of Jesus that are. Ex- that are illustrated or, or exemplified in these people on the margin. So my first Peter work was getting me thinking about how marginalized people represent Jesus in the world. Then I had all this pastoral experience of being in churches that wanted to be cross-cultural or, or interracial or whatever the language was at the time, multi-ethnic now we're saying. And in those conversations, people seem to be satisfied with the notion of proximity. If we could just get people together, you know, sing together, eat together, then we would kind of solve our our issues. So they were focusing on proximity, but not on power. So I started to realize that that was sort of the missing element in some of our conversations about uh, uh, Christians of different backgrounds coming together. So I then said, you know, I really do believe that Peter, but not just Peter, that the Bible is showing us that God uses as Paul says to the Corinthian church, the things that are of little importance in the eyes of the world, right? The weak, the flesh, the ignoble to Hmm. show the way of God. So that kind of turning the tables kind of message that's throughout the scriptures, I wanted to put into practical terms for us today. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I totally can follow that that track from First Peter and some of, yeah, those themes. It just really makes sense mm-hmm. in light of uh, what I'm seeing in the book. And Thank it's you. it's really fascinating, too. I mean, you're you're very clear that um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my my sense is, as I'm reading is your your target audience are folks who find themselves at the margins and you're, you're inviting them into something um, while yeah. also while also someone like me as a white middle class <laughs> male uh, have a lot to find and discover in here, but from a different um, mm. slant, I think. Um, so talk about some of yeah. that, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind at all. Um, and there, I appreciate you noticing that because, you know, I give a little story or at least I, I remind people who may have seen the movie A Black Panther of a scene in there where they're, where folks are trying to get help, folks in Wakanda are trying to get help from one of the tribes that has not been, uh, uh, has been kind of on the sidelines, the Jabari tribe. So they go to appeal to the Jabari for their help. The, the head of the tribe, M'Baku, is sitting kind of on his throne with a staff. And in the appeal, the white uh, CIA agent, Agent Ross, starts doing all the talking. And the Jabari bark and they drown him out. And I, I laughed and I wanted to stand up and cheer at that scene because I, I, I seem to have been in my lifetime kind of out-talked and put to the side by white people who sort of assume a sense of authority in almost every gathering I've been in. So this idea that uh, the white people can be quiet right now and let us do some talking really appeal to me. Um, I, I, I wanted uh, to, to elevate and amplify our voices. And at the same time, I, I noticed that a lot of books that have been written about race or racial reconciliation or even biblical ideas about race are typically targeted to white people to try to get them to behave differently or act differently or see the world differently. That is a noble cause. I, I don't dismiss it. But at the, at the same time, I know there are people who are like in my age group or been brought up like me, especially within white evangelicalism to feel, to have been made to feel at times. I don't know what, if we feel it, but we've been put in a place where, um, where our voices are, have been so muted that I wanted to say, Hey, 
We have something to contribute. So don't wait for white people to give you permission or to tell you it's okay or to quote unquote empower you. You have power from God and your experience as a marginalized person in this world, as a follower of Jesus, gives you authority to speak and to and to uh, demonstrate what Jesus is like in this world. So yes, I appreciate you catching all of that. I, I target the folks whose voices have often been muted. Yeah, wow. That's, uh, yeah, thank you for taking us into that world. I know um, there's a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, white folks, especially right now that are asking lots of questions and mm -hmm. to, to be able to hear from your lens, like, hey, keep asking those questions. That's really appropriate. Mm -hmm. But um, we've also got to find our own, um, as marginalized people, our own sort of power that we have from God and our own sort of strength and contribution um, beyond those uh, those maybe fresh wanderings and curiosities. And I, I just see uh, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of good in that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you. And, yeah. And I, I, I kind of to build a bridge here a little bit uh, to the content even more. Uh, one of the major themes uh, that you brought up from First Peter even uh, is this idea of being a, di a diaspora people. And yeah. I'm curious if you you could give some reflections. I mean, here we are. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle mm. of um, various uh um, rulings like the Breonna Taylor ruling that we just heard. We're in the middle of protests and some that have gone towards the riot mm. zone. You know, we're yeah. in an election year. I mean, there's just so many. Uh, it, it's the uh, storm <laughs> that mm. no one saw coming all at once. And maybe <laughs> right. maybe they did. But, uh, you know, so being a diaspora people in the USA, what is, what does that even mean now? Yeah, like what, yeah. what are we even doing here as followers of Jesus in the midst of all of this? Wow. Yeah. I mean, thank you. That's, you made some good observations there. I, on the one level, the diaspora uh, metaphor can apply to every Christian believer. Cause I think Peter is sort of doing that and in addressing this Christian community, which may have been largely Gentile, but also Jew, uh, Jewish. But the Gentile part of that community would have been people who had friendships and allegiances and all kinds of ties to the culture. And now they're following Jesus. So there's, you know, they're not at the same parties, the same social gatherings, the same uh, uh, level of relationships. So they're outcasts in that sense. They are on the margins themselves, even if they were not uh, geographically moving they are socially disconnected. And there's a little bit of an academic argument. Are they really just socially disconnected? Are they really immigrants? I mean, that's, but the point is the function is the same. So if you look at our society and you see the way immigrants have often been treated in this country or people have been brought here on, as some have said, on different ships, but we got here and the way the dominant culture has treated anybody that doesn't come from the parts of Europe that they, that they uh, uh, saw as better, they get marginalized. So diaspora status means you're marginalized and you're never comfortable in the place. You are vulnerable and alienated. Uh, the, the theologian Willie Jennings has written beautifully on this image of diaspora in his commentary in the book of Acts, and I cite him in my book. But, but my point is alienation, vulnerability, that's associated with people who are uh, diaspora people. And it could mean literally that they came here from someplace else like African-Americans or like uh, immigrants uh, to this country. And if they are people of faith, the way they have maneuvered their alienation and their vulnerability is actually the way Jesus maneuvered in his time as somebody in the marginalized culture who was uh, under this Roman oppression, who did not uh, fight with uh, weapons, but whose love and whose connection to God um, uh, uh, was evident in, uh, in that, uh, uh, in that world. And I say, likewise, for anybody who's, who's living uh, for Jesus, who's been pushed aside and made to feel as if they don't belong, that's actually where we should be looking for what the way of Jesus, uh, looks like. 
Yeah. Wow. And that, that to me is um, challenging um, in the right way. I mean, mm -hmm. really challenging, um, you know, from my experience of the world to, to say, I have as, you know, a person in a privileged place in society, I have a different kind of barrier to understand a marginalized Messiah and the movement that comes out of that in the sense that um, I have to undo a lot of the things that privilege has kind of imposed it's you know in in my journey yeah. and yeah. have to and and I think yeah looking looking to folks who um you know their barriers are are different kinds of barriers and yeah um and ones that have been imposed and you know created this diaspora yeah. reality uh there's right. there's something to learn there that's um really uh going to continue to pique my curiosity, I, I guess I'll say. And um, right, it, it right. seems it seems to me that um, this book is really calling out those qualities in mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. a very clear way. I mean, if I were to, I'm going to pull my, my table of contents out here, but I'm thinking, yeah. you know, uh, talk about diaspora, discerning mm -hmm. injustice and prophecy, anger, solidarity, right. worship, hope, the spirit, love. I mean, these are <laughs> values and attributes uh, to to really uh, lean into. And it, it, it sounds to me like Might from the Margins is a lot about noticing those those possibilities um, for for especially those folks who are indeed at the margins. Yes, yes, thank you. So, right, none of those things that, that are in that list on the table of contents is unique to any one group, right? But mm -hmm. but let's say, for example, we want to, we, when we, we, and I say we right now to mean just Christians in, in North American context, when we want to look at successful models of ministry, we tend to look at, this is this is just the way it is, we tend to look at, white pastors, mostly guys with big churches, and we see how they do things and we model after them. Then we sort of get like googly eyed over leaders who get access to people in power, you know, politicians, yeah. and even get to sit by the president. And what we have found is that by doing all of that, it's not actually made Christianity better. We're now fragmented. We've got a questionable sense of allegiance. We kind of beholden, or maybe we are uh, given in to nationalism. I say this we in a broad sense, but I see it mostly in white evangelicalism, which is the perhaps the loudest Christian voice in our in our culture. So so even though they want to, uh, uh, all Christians want to see people exhibit hope and the power of worship and the things that I talk about in the book, I'm saying it's the marginalized Christians that are showing us closer to what it is to uh, practice those things in the way of Jesus. But let's borrow a little bit from the sociologists. I mean, there's something called standpoint theory where people say uh, those who are closest, those those who are closest to the, on the on the bottom are the best able to discern oppressive systems. And so now you're seeing this happening right now. So when we talk about racism in the country and we say something as innocuous as Black Lives Matter, the people who are most upset with that are the people in the power. It, they're the people who are saying, wait a second, you're going to mm. minimize me. Nobody yeah. has said that. Nobody who's on the bottom is saying we need to minimize anybody else. We're just saying we need to get up mm. and uh, or, or, or we need to make sure we come together and rise up so that you take us seriously. But also you should not be oppressing us, you know, or be part of a system that mm. oppress, that oppresses us. So I so there's a couple. So there's a several things going on there. Um, the other thing I want to say is when, when I talk about the voice from the margins needing to be heard and amplified and received and all those things, I am not saying that every white person needs to make sure they find some black person that they can keep on asking their their uh, questions to and start to get yeah. racism, <laughs> you know, get their racism 101 lessons from. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that there are leaders in in uh, uh, who are people of color who are pastors, who are teachers, who are professors, who, and I don't, I don't just mean the Christian world, I mean every discipline. And my question is, when does the dominant culture ever receive those people as authoritative or even as mentors? Um, there's too much happening and too much has been allowed to happen where we see those or maybe hear those voices, but then we got to check them with a white source to make sure that they're okay or, or, or to back it up in some way. 
I see this certainly all over evangelicalism. If a black leader says something, I see a lot of white folks want to check and see if that measures up with what they've learned from somebody white. So, so in other words, the real authority is white and European, and the black person's authority is only as good as it matches up with that white European analysis. So I'm saying, then you're not accepting that black person's authoritative. You're still holding something you've held before as authoritative. So, you know, it, it it does mean a shift for white people. I understand that. But that's why I decided not to write the book for white people, because I'm not sure what existential crisis white people are going to go through. But I'm saying for us not to mute ourselves as people on the margins, but to keep on teaching, giving a, a, a biblical and spiritual uh, um, uh, strength and example and and uh, and to show who we are. And and if those and if people have ears to hear, then let them hear. Yeah. 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 Wow. Thank you. And um, there's there's definitely been lots to hear. And some folks have been tone deaf and some some folks have been listening and some folks yeah. are afraid to admit they're listening. And, you know, there, it's such a such a um, uh, there's from, from from my end. I, I mean, I see a lot of hope and I see a lot of Good. real dismay and kind of, oh, okay. Okay. you know, well, I hear that. Yeah. 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 When, and uh, anyway, it just, it seems yeah. as though, um, there, there are some folks that I wouldn't have imagined being willing to listen to marginalized voices on these things that are yeah. opening themselves up. And then there's been a lot of resistance. And as yeah. a, as a leader in your situation, how, how are you interpreting the, the situation that we find ourselves in? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I'm. I, I, I get sad and sometimes I'll even say angry um, when I see uh, the and maybe I it's mostly social media. So I, I don't I want to characterize it as such. It's not as if say, social media may uh, show something and it appear to be bigger than what it is. So I'll, I'll just make that caveat. But what I do see is a, a strong pushback to anything that certain uh, evangelicals would deem as quote unquote worldly. And right now it's easy, easy to call it Marxist or something else that, you know, kind of raises the hackles. It's like the left saying that Trump's like Hitler and then everybody gets really mad because, oh, you can't do that. You can't make the, the parallel. It's kind of almost that way to just easily caricature something that you don't like or don't understand or don't want to uh, get into. So I, 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 I don't know people's motives. I just know it's easy and I see it uh, relatively easy to dismiss people with whom um, you don't agree, right? And uh, and so we have much yeah. space for dialogue. Uh, and that's the sad part for me, that, that we don't have much place for dialogue. But at the same time, I've, I've watched to see how whiteness, when it acts as a power in our society, can um, uh, divide and conquer. So it'll, it'll work with the minorities who, or ethnic uh, minorities or women or whomever who, who think just like them, elevate them and kind of use them as foils against the rest of us who don't necessarily see things that way. And that's, that's never a healthy thing. And then we've got our whole political interests that get infused into all of this. And so rather than the church kind of standing apart from the political systems and being prophetic toward it, they are now beholden to it. So they're trying to get some power within those structures. That I think is just the one of the scariest, dangerous parts. I don't think that's biblical. I don't think that was happening in the early church in terms of trying to get their validation and power from Rome. So all of those things are happening, right? And I think that's what makes us kind of divided over over these matters. Um, but I'm speaking from my side of things, of course. I'm think, seeing from the bottom, and I would hope that people in the top, and I use bottom and top carefully because uh, I'm reading uh, Isabel Wilkinson, well, I finished it, Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, and she has a powerful analysis of the way cast works in America. Hmm. So bottom and top is kind of related that way, you know, the, the way we think of uh, cast. But anyway, folks on the bottom have a lot that um, if we were to rise together, join in solidarity, could demonstrate something that I think is different than what the world is seeing right now in the way Christians have been antagonistic toward one another. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And uh, it's the political part of it. I mean, that's been clearly uh, it's so it's so sad that mm. so many people lean into 
political philosophy and then say, and my Christian worldview supports this by dot, dot, dot. And it, it, it's like, don't we start with Jesus? Don't we start with the gospels? Don't we start with, you know, the epistles and, and really try and navigate the world um, through that lens. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering, here we are, we're talking about might from the margins and we're in an election year. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the conversations are from folks that I actually would say are either um, empathetic uh, with sort of, hey, black lives absolutely matter. And they they see the systems as corrupt or whatever. And one of the challenges that I've seen in certain, you know, whether it be Anabaptist circles or or other circles is sort of we're going to just opt out where we mm -hmm. we think the whole thing's evil and any sort of movement towards the system is um, collusion with empire, maybe someone would say. And so I'm curious, you know, here we are, we're in a situation where um, we're going to be casting votes and um, what, you know, thinking about the margins, uh, yeah. How, yeah. how, you know, I, I, to me, I'm just curious about how folks um, ought to be navigating that reality um, mm -hmm. when it mm -hmm. comes to, mm -hmm. you know, um, the mm -hmm. the empowering that we see happen amongst folks from the bottom versus the sort of I can float here because I live at the top when it comes to elections and these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Ow. Well, you know, that's it's interesting. So let's take. Uh, uh, something as, um, okay, inflammatory as police brutality, right? So when when Colin Kaepernick was first uh, protesting and taking a knee, the, uh, the white power structures, including in the White House, uh, characterized his protests as anti-American, anti-flag, anti-even uh, the troops. And none mm. of that was anything that Colin Kaepernick said. I mean, if you just asked him, he would tell you his protest was about police brutality, yet it got characterized in a certain way. And, and that kind of thing just went off into the into the stratosphere. Right. So hmm. um, and, and it wasn't until recently when when George Floyd was murdered by the police officer in in Minneapolis that some people started to say, oh, you know, Kaepernick was right. And, and you started to see even the NFL, of course, is marketing, but all folks starting to wear you know, armbands or do this or, you know, mm -hmm. I, the, the thing is, black folks have been saying that all along. And and Colin Kaepernick was uh, just a high profile person saying it. So people were not looking, quote unquote, to the margins until something got caught on video that they sort of couldn't deny. And then they had to sort of nuance it. But even even with that, you still have some people doubling down like the president and others kind of doubling down on white uh, supremacy. And, and trying to look at those things as just aberrations and strangeness when this has been happening in our country since its foundations. So I'm saying it's the folks on the bottom who know that. So they're going to vote that way. But I'm going to say a little bit about voting in that voting is it's the low hanging fruit. It's sort of the you can do to sort of get into into shaping some things in our society. <clears throat> the church should be yeah. doing the shape, shaping from the outside. But as much as we can, we can influence at least our society in a particular direction and in voting and in activism and in other ways. And uh, our friend Drew Hart has written much about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that's a uh, uh, really, really um, helpful analysis. And um, I continue to, you know, because I, I think for a season I was, I, I probably leaned towards that posture of just forget the system. You know, this was years yeah. back um, right. saying, you know what? It's it's empire. I'm going to just stay outside of this thing. And um, now I'm kind of, yeah, your, your low hanging fruit image makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. And and, you know, as we, we think about these things, I mean, um, you know, you mentioned George Floyd and many of the mm -hmm. things that have come to light this year that yeah. for some people is new for many and most folks at the margins is sort of the same old thing, just a different response, maybe. Right. Um, your your chapter on anger, I thought was mm -hmm. really, really constructive and helpful. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, Thank at you. one. Yeah, you have this. Uh, just a quick quote here. I think it's on page 105, I think is what I have here. It mm -hmm. says, not all anger is redemptive, 
but mm -hmm. can be a powerful motivator to create something good. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if you could help us understand and think about, um, mm -hmm. you know, the power anger brings with it for good. And then how, in what ways is, uh, is so anger can be redemptive and good and then mm -hmm. of yeah. course i think some folks go to but anger also brings literal destruction uh spirit it can bring spiritual destruction at times you right. know right uh, we've seen and, and of course the media is highlighting the worst <clears throat> of the worst of scenarios mm -hmm. that have come up um and so uh you know i i've heard some spiritual teachers say anger that Jesus was never actually angry, <laughs> you know, and, and I've had to actually go back and say, no, um, we, we need to have a more nuanced conversation about this. And I, I feel like your chapter really accomplishes that. And so talk to us about some of the things we ought to be considering with the, the anger and following Jesus. Thank you. Um, I, I did try to nuance things because nobody wants just people to be walking around grumpy all the time or on edge or, or, you know, ready to fight all the time, be combative. That's, that's certainly not what I'm saying, but the idea, uh, and that's in Ephesians, which actually is phrased as a command. And I, I, you know, I'm checking the Greek grammar. I'm doing all that I can because I know it's disputed, but it says, be angry. Um, don't sin and don't let hmm. the sun go down on your, on your wrath. So this notion of being permitted, even commanded to be angry, suggest there should be some anger at the right kind of thing, right? Um, and yeah. Jesus did, I mean, Jesus is described as angry at least a couple of times in Mark's gospel. There's a third time, but there's a textual issue there I won't get into. But but there's two times, and sometimes it's translated angry, sometimes indignant. Clearly, Jesus was upset. He went to heal the man with the withered hand. Another instance, uh, he gets upset with the disciples who were preventing children from coming to him for a blessing. Jesus is showing that he's more concerned about the man with the withered hand than he is about Sabbath laws. The so-called law and order mm. people were saying to him, you know, in essence, don't you realize what day this is? And Jesus said, like, don't you see this guy with a withered hand? You know, so he's yeah. he's, ang he's angry at, at, this folk, at those folks, and he does uh, a work to fix the situation, which is what justice, I think, is about. So I'm not saying, again, that people should be on edge, but we have seen anger play out in such that it's yeah, you know, and Christians have long said righteous indignation. I didn't want to use this euphemism. I wanted to say straight out, it's anger, but it's anger that gets channeled. It's anger. Um, it's easy to dismiss black people with whom you you disagree. I've seen white people do that because they say, well, they're angry, as if to say what they what they're about to articulate or what they have articulated is without merit. No. Anger is one of those secondary emotions that that come into play when we know something's not right. And we and and so it's it's a natural emotion. And I try to say that in that chapter and give some data about that. But the reality of it is it's a motivator. It shouldn't just be festering. It motivates us to go and fix things. It goes it motivates us to speak out. It motivates us to to bring God's shalom into a situation. So it's a trigger. And I, and and now some people go the wrong way with it. And we've seen our country angry with minority folks rising up. So that, you know, even in, in re Reconstruction, so Jim Crow laws have to come in. Then lynching was was something that was, oh, my goodness, pervasive throughout South and in other parts mm. of this country because white anger had power with it to do destruction. Uh, so when people get mad about rioting and stuff, I'm not advocating rioting, but certainly the limited property destruction is nowhere near the level of st state sanctioned killing. And that's, yeah. so there's a difference in how anger gets played out. So my point is let anger channel our actions toward uh, righteousness, towards justice. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's really, really helpful. And, um, you know, that that's been a paradigm shift I, that I've had to process in my own unique way. I think that, mm. um, anger in and of itself is actually not, um, yeah, not indicative of necessarily a a spiritual sort of flaw or, um, right. you know, a, a an area where I now need discipleship. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's it's actually right. You you have mm -hmm. anger. It's authentic. And now, what what am I going to do with this right. this very righteous energy that 
the spirit yeah. may be prompting within right. me. Right. right? Like, oh like, my goodness. Uh, weren't, weren't the prophets like that? I mean, Jeremiah, it's fire. Shut up with my bones. I have to get out there and speak this message. And my goodness, yeah. talk about getting marginalized. It gets thrown in a pit and all kinds of stuff. But the, but you just said it, I, that there's this, you, you called it energy. And I like that because that's really what, what it is. So I know there's a tendency in uh, evangelicalism, because I grew up around this, um, that things have to be kind of nice and polite and stuff. And, and Jesus wasn't always nice and polite, although he was upright and I would say caring for everyone that he, that he encountered. Um, so, but his anger could be on display in denouncing hypocrisy or denouncing injustice or limiting access, like with those children, all of that. And Jesus could speak up and speak forthrightly to it. That's what I think anger does. Yeah, at least what it could do and should do. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's really, really helpful. And um, I, I think it, it gives frame to the things we see on the news and also the very good things that are happening as Christians uh, use their voice, their bodies, their whatever they're able to offer right now to give um, give voice to that injustice. And um, so so I'm grateful for the way you frame that. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, another another key chapter uh, is a chapter on hope kind of towards mm. the back end of the book. And, yeah. and for me, this is <clears throat> hope over the years has become this sort of theological framework through which I try and understand most of scripture, um, you know, in the sense that um, as Christians, hope is the thing that, um, you know, the hope that the world's not always going to be this way. The hope that yeah. Christ um, is making all things new and will continue to make us new towards that end. And, and, you know, I, I, there's this quote on page 139 that I think is just really important. You say, hope gives people who appear powerless the wherewithal to survive and in many cases to thrive. Mm. And so I, I want to hear some reflections, if you don't mind, about hope as a space of or a means through which God empowers um, Jesus people at the margins. Yeah, you know, I thank you. I I think of people just in the generation right before me. Um, I, I I tell a few stories in there, but one I don't think I tell in this in this uh, book, but it's about my great aunt who uh, came from the South, part of the Great Migration from South Carolina up to uh, for her up to D.C. My mother um, uh, and and uh, and my grandmother, you know, so that that would be the uh, sister and the niece <laughs> of this great aunt continued hmm. on past DC and went up to New York. And, and that's kind of where my story starts. But, but, but these women fled the South during a time with, with Jim Crow segregation, with, with all kinds of, uh, horrors that they didn't often talk about. In fact, we could hardly ever get them to talk about their life down South. And I found that it wasn't just the case in my family. It's been true in other families too, because there's trauma there. Um, here right. that I can that I could get into, but my point is, with their faith, oh, and all three women uh, did domestic work. My mother eventually became a licensed practical nurse, but that's not the same as an RN. But she, she was she got some level of training there. But my my grandmother and 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 her sister, they were they were maids and cooks for white people for all their professional lives, and also had to take care of their own families. And you, yet they could articulate this faith in Jesus that gave them a hope. And that hope was, was something about not just that their life would get better, but that life would be better for their children and their grandchildren. Wow. And, that, and that their life with Jesus would be uh, ultimately the most meaningful. Now, I know that could sound like a cop-out for some people, the pie in the sky kind of thing. But if your faith in Jesus is so real that you actually believe that it's better to have life with him, then you're like the Apostle Paul, to live as Christ, die as gain. Yeah. Wow. So, so I'm saying I see that kind of hope in people whose lives were, were, um, you know, you wouldn't have thought twice about who's cleaning your kitchen. You don't think about the help as it were, if you're a white person in power, but those folks with faith are the ones who are, who are showing us biblical values. So they have this hope that transcends circumstances. I want to learn from those folks. Yeah. Wow. What a, thank you for that story and that yeah, to hear to hear the way that this uh, 
directly influenced your um, your own family and your own history mm -hmm. is just yeah. a beautiful picture of, yeah, there there is something, there's wisdom in mm -hmm. the margins that yeah. that doesn't Amen. exist, doesn't exist when you're comfortable, you know, there, there, That's right. you, you can't, you don't naturally, I, I don't want to say you can't, but you don't naturally discover that kind of biblical hope in Christ when there's not really a big reason to find hope at all. You know, uh, things are how, you know, you've got power, you've got uh, resources, you, you know, things are fine and, and you can, Amen. you can delay it, you know, hope's yeah. over there, yeah. you know, uh, I want to yeah. go to heaven when I die because my, my really nice house is going to be replaced with an even nicer one. You know? <laughs> exactly. 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 Yeah. Oh, well, so, so mm -hmm. well, no, I mean, you're, you're the one saying it. I, I just, yeah, I, I, I just really appreciate that. And again, it invites, it invites me to consider my own life and uh, the intersections right. that I inhabit. It invites folks who are yeah. listening yeah. and re hopefully reading um, with their own intersections of life to, to say, you know what, the bottom doesn't, doesn't mean um, powerless. The bottom actually means power that others may not have as natural an access to. And so, um, that's right. yeah, step into it. What does that mean? You know, yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah that's inspiring. Well, well, thank you for seeing that. I, and, and even as I tell that story in some way or about my own family, I think in some ways, you know, I've, I've noticed some folks in the, in the more dominant part of our world and the culture and white folks in our country who could, could hear that story and have a sense of like pity or sorrow for my family. And that is not the emotion that I want to evoke. I want to evoke uh, a strength that arises from folks who um, who dealt with all the all the mess that they were having to, to go through and could. At, at, at my great aunt's funeral, I remember the eulogist uh, was a federal judge who um, who was in his 60s at the time, retired then, and he had been in the uh, 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 one of the first people to hold him in his arms was my was my great grandmother. Or hold him in her arms rather was my was my great aunt. So he gave the eulogy because he knew he knew her all his life, literally. And uh, and in there, he talked about her living out, you know, something as simple as the golden rule. She did to others that she would have to do to her. And she treated everybody who came into her house with tremendous hospitality and love and respect. Yet this woman had de dealt with all this mess, mess. So I'm not asking for pity for folks like that. I'm saying, oh, my goodness, I would much rather learn the way of Jesus, Jesus from her than some flashy evangelist who has access to the president. That person is not showing me the way of Jesus, but my great aunt is. That's what I say. So not pity. I want you to see that pow power that's present yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, I mean, that... Yeah, that's that good. Oh my gosh, that resounds so loudly in this book. And I just, again, I want to encourage anyone listening to grab this book, um, absorb it and process it from your own sort of space in life and um, recognize that the power of the gospel is there to upend and to mm -hmm. um, bring life, you know? And so yeah, I am just so, so grateful for your work and what you've done here. And, um, you know, as we transition towards the end, I'm curious if you want to just share um, mm. some ways folks can continue to connect with your work and you're working on a couple of projects and you, you know, however much of that yeah. you want to say or not say yet is sure, fine, but sure. point people a direction who want to follow up beyond the book. Well, thank you so much, Kurt. I, I do enjoy talking with you and I appreciate your own work and, uh, and how you put your voice out in uh, podcasts and you had blog and, and, and you have a book coming out. So I, I, I want to affirm what you do. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so every place you can find me, I go by the, the moniker uh, uh, Rev Dr. Dre. So I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, all at R-E-V-D-R-D-R-E. -R -E -R -E, and that's actually my website as well, RevDrDre.com. So you can find me in all those places. Is, and I'm working right now on a book on humility, and I think uh, we need a nuanced biblical view of humility, uh, especially um, when we consider the marginalized folks. But, but this is a little mm. more of an academic work, but a hopefully an accessible one that people can use. And uh, and then I've got some other projects, but that's the next one that I'm trying that I'm excited about and, and, and working on right now. So thanks again for the opportunity. Appreciate it. 
Yeah, no, it's exciting stuff. We'll definitely, when the book goes into production and you're ready, we'll have to have a humility conversation. I'm definitely looking forward to that one. And uh, um, I like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you so much again for being on. And we'll look forward to the next conversation. All right. Well, God bless you. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks for listening to Theology Curator. For more resources from Kurt Willems, check out theologycurator.com forward slash newsletter to sign up for our email update list. For new listeners of the podcast, we hope you will subscribe via iTunes, Google, or your podcast manager of choice. If you like what you hear, please leave the show a review. For regular listeners, consider supporting Kurt's online ministry at patreon.com forward slash Kurt Willems. Lastly, please don't let this conversation end when the episode is over. We hope you feel empowered in regular life to explore theology and faith in intelligent and humanizing ways.